She'd like to hear the ocean song again Snap mountain trails that touch the wind Cast her heart down long winding country roads From this window frame our sunset views <laughs> So my name is uh, Peter Kaysen. I'm an interpretive park ranger here at San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park sometimes known as the littlest park with the longest name. And we are aboard the 1886 sailing ship Balclua, or you could call it Balclutha. And uh, I'm gonna talk as we go around and observe the ship both on deck, above deck and below deck, we're gonna really talk about what life was like on a very typical sailing ship of her period. She is for her time an ordinary ship meaning that she looked and worked just like thousands of other sailing ships that went into the deep oceans. And because of her ordinariness in that respect, we can talk a lot about general sailing life in the late 19th century on a ship going around Cape Horn. Anytime you have questions, comments, observations, just feel free at any time this, during the tour. I'll be able to hear you through this mic. Um, so let's first talk about some of the basics of the ship, and then we'll get into how you became a sailor in the first place. Then we'll take you to our first stop on the foredeck. So this was built in 1886 in Glasgow. The reason why, and reason why she was built was because during that time in Europe, they were going through droughts, serious droughts and crop failures. They needed wheat. So over 700 ships were built to carry California wheat because we were growing in our Central Valley, very fine superior wheat. That was all taken aboard, brought around Cape Horn at the bottom of South America, not stopping anywhere until she got to where she needed to go in Europe, places like England and Wales. Offload the wheat and then she'd bring back all sorts of general cargo for San Francisco, anything needed for our very fast growing city. Later in the tour, we'll go below deck and we'll see some of that cargo that she brought over. Well, let's talk about how you became a sailor in the first place. Well, in those days, there were really only two ways to become a sailor. You couldn't go directly to the ship and ask for a job. It was done through the boarding houses where sailors would sleep in between voyages and the saloons. And often the saloons and boarding houses were just one establishment. And both men and women would work those, uh, own those boarding houses. They were known as crimps. And it was through those crimps you would get a job. So two ways to get a job. Number one, you could go willingly. Uh, you could sign shipping articles. That was your contract. And that said you had to go for the entire voyage wherever they were, these ships were going until they got back to where they originally started from, you wouldn't get paid. So there you were for the entire voyage. Now, during labor shortages, when it was very difficult to find enough sailors, they would kidnap sailors. It was known as Shanghai sailors. And they could put a drug in your drink in the saloon or just knock you out. And uh, if you were a boarding house keeper, saloon keeper, owner, uh, you were paid. You would charge the captain money for each sailor sent aboard ship. And then to recover that money, that was taken out of your pay. So if you're a sailor, whether or not you're shanghai or you sign aboard a ship through those crimps, your first month and sometimes your sometimes two months' wages are gone. They call the dead horses pay. So that's how you became a sailor back then. And if you're new to a ship, you've got to learn your way around pretty quickly. You just follow the more experienced sailors. And the first order would be to weigh anchor, man the capstan. Maybe you don't know what it means, but you see all the other sailors running to the foredeck and you go with them. We're going to go there. We're not going to run. We're going to take a nice easy walk. And here we go. And the capstan was what really drove what's below here called the windlass. The anchor chain goes around the windlass and the anchor is matching the anchor in the water. And you got about sometimes a quarter mile of chain that you have to get up before the anchor itself is raised. So you put these wooden bars 
into the capsule. Let me do this lower level here. There we go. And they would have bars all around here. And the whole crew, 22 sailors, would be weighing anchor. And that means raising up the anchor. Each of these anchors weighs about a ton. So imagine straining your back at this. You get the mechanical advantage of the windlass and the capstan, but still, with all that weight, imagine not only the one-ton anchor, but about a quarter mile of really heavy anchor chain you're getting up. So um, the order would go out to heave away, and they'd start turning this around. Would you hear that clicking noise? Those little brakes called paws. Now here's a question for everyone. How long do you think it might take to weigh anchor? Any guesses? Any yeah, ideas how long you might be turning this capstan around? A couple of hours. Ten minutes. Yeah, it was it, about three to four hours just to oh, raise wow. anchor. Wow. So we'll be done with this part of the tour at about two o'clock this afternoon, and then we'll move on to another part of the ship. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's another question. This could be really boring, monotonous, backbreaking work. And you think of something you might do to not only set rhythm, but try to ease the experience and lift your spirits a little bit while doing this job. Sing. Singing, exactly. That's what the sailors do. They'd sing sea shanties, work songs. There are thousands of different work songs. I'm going to show you a little example of one. It's called the Sailboat Malarkey. There was a ship called the Malachi, but the sailors called it the Malarkey. And uh, you had one sailor called the Shantyman. And as the Shantyman would sing out verses, the sailors would sing back the same chorus over and over again. So... I'll teach you the chorus, and I'm going to invite you, wherever you are, wherever you're listening, to sing along. So I'll sing out, Oh, tell me, what is this good ship's name? And your part after each verse is, It's the sailboat malarkey. <laughs> so that's your part. And give it a try. As a great shantyman once said, Singing a shanty is like being thrown a lifeline if you're overboard. It doesn't matter where you grab it, as long as you grab it before it all goes by. So <laughs> pick up the course when you can. Here we go. Heave away! Oh, tell me what is this good ship's name? It's the sailboat Malarkey. Oh, tell me, tell me what's her name? It's the sailboat Malarkey. Who is the man who built this fine ship? It's the sailboat Malarkey. Richardson, Richardson built this fine ship. It's the sailboat Malarkey. And on and on. And then the anchor is finally up, and uh, the command is to to uh, avast your hauling. Let me stop. And then heave a paw, we go backwards, and those brakes, those paws drop into place, and there we are. Bar is up, bar is out, I'm gonna put this back. So uh, they would get four hours of sleep, and while one watch or a group of sailors, that's half the crew, is sleeping, the other half or the other watch is out there working. Now, there's a signal of when the people working can finally go to sleep. The people sleeping have to get out of their bunks and work, and that is the bell. So let's take a look at the ship's bell. And they'd ring it. I'm going to head down so I can see it. Okay, very good. So they'd ring this, and every half hour they'd give it a ring. And finally, you get up to eight bells. And that signals four hours. So when you hear eight bells, if you're working, you love the sound of eight bells. You can get sleep. If you're sleeping, got to jump out of your bunk. They do it in twos like this. So 
there's even a song about eight bells. So I'm going to come down and join you. Can't imagine sleeping through that. Yeah. If anyone did, the mate would come in and yell at you. Get out of your bunk. Now, sometimes you would get a sailor, might be a little lazy, didn't want to get out immediately. There was a case where a sailor feigned being sick. The other sailors got wind of it, that he was just faking it. So what they did is that they tied a line, a rope, around his ankles, and then they all went out of the forecastle. they went up onto the foredeck, and they all hauled together and pulled him out of his bunk. And that was the last time you ever faked being sick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, someone else mentioned eating. So I'm going to take you over to the galley, and we're going to talk about their meal, what they had three times a day, seven days a week for up to six months out at sea. We're passing the fore hatch. This is one of three hatches they would open up to load cargo. You have the fore hatch, the main hatch, and an after hatch. Well, here's the ship's pig <laughs> and the pig pen. This pig is named Sal Putha. First, uh, there was a naming contest for this pig, and the winning name was Sir Francis Bacon. And then it was pointed out as to Sal, which is a female pig, so the name was changed to Sal Putha. <laughs> and this is really the only fresh meat aboard ship. Uh, it would only last for one meal, so it was saved for a special occasion, such as a Christmas dinner. We're going to take you over to the galley. We're going to talk about how they kept food up to six months aboard here. So here's the galley. We're looking in. We're seeing a, an iron stove there, wood-burning stove. And they would bring up wood from below, and they would store it in that gray cabinet that you see there down, used as needed. It would take about an hour and a half or so to, in the morning to get the stove hot enough to do cooking. And you see there's no way to really control the heat. So what the cook would do, if he wanted to boil food, he would use the hot spot right there at the very center. We see that round grate there. Mm -hmm. And if he wanted to just simmer food, he would move it away from the hot spot more to the side of the area. So here's another question for you. I'm just curious of what your favorite foods are. What would you like to eat if you were aboard ship? <laughs> T-bone steak, baked potato. <laughs> you said a T-bone steak. steak. <laughs> okay, I hear steak. Yeah. Right. Biscuits. Well, they did have beef. But how do you preserve beef if you're out at sea with no refrigeration or freezers? Salt. That's a good question. Salt, yes. Plenty of salt. Exactly. So they had the worst cuts of beef because the ship owners were pretty cheap as far as the sales were concerned. And they were not very respected, considered the lowest of the low. And the British Board of Trade... Um, this was run under the British flag during her years going around the horn in the wheat trade. And they really had written out exactly how much food per man per day. So first they brought aboard wooden barrels, uh, really cheap cuts of meat, a lot of bone and fat and gristle mixed in, packed in plenty of salt. And the cook would boil it up for several hours. You can boil out enough salt to eat it. You could boil out flavor, boil out nutrition, and there you have it. So beef or pork, and it was served up with fat that came off it called slush. That was the sailor's word for fat. They sometimes even nicknamed the cook slushy. And that slush was a delicacy. They'd spread it over the other staple of their diet called hardtack. That was a very hard biscuit made of just flour and water and a little leavening. And that Slush softened up a bit. It gave it some flavor. Otherwise, it was pretty flavorless. The biscuit could sometimes have an unwanted source of protein that came in with the sacks of flour that was baked into the biscuit. What do you think that was? The bugs? Yes, bugs, weevils. You got it. 
Well, it did have a little protein, <laughs> but uh, they had to deal with that as well. They could have occasionally dried peas or dried beans boiled up into a stew, but the hardtack, salt beef, salt pork was the staple of their diet. No way to keep fresh vegetables aboard ship. They did have water rations. Earlier, someone mentioned having a drink. Well, you couldn't have any alcohol aboard a merchant ship. Uh, so they had water rations and they squeezed lime juice into the water and lime juice would keep the sailors from getting scurvy, the illness they would get if they didn't have any citrus in their diet. So scurvy wasn't a big problem aboard these ships at this time in history as it was earlier before they discovered they could prevent and even cure scurvy with citrus. And that's why these ships became known as lime juicers and the sailors became known as limeys. Ah. A little later, we'll talk about the food that the captain, the officers, and the captain's family ate. Yeah, let's, let, let's open up the oven there, see where they baked the hardtack. Yeah. And pump away. Slowly as they turn these pumps around, water would come up wash out through there, wash out to sea, but the sailors would have to keep their eye out that there's not a big wave coming over so they don't get washed out to sea as well. It's another long, monotonous job. Every afternoon at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, that 4 o'clock watch, they'd have to go out and do this pumping. And again, they would use sea shanties to set rhythm. In 1902, the ship was sold to a Bay Area firm called the Alaska Packers Association. They took fishermen, usually Italian and Scandinavian immigrant fishermen, to Alaska, and they brought cannery workers, um, usually Mexican, Filipino, and Chinese cannery workers. And in April, they would go to Alaska to Chignik Bay, and they would work, the fishermen would fish for salmon, cannery workers working in the canneries. Once it was fished, it was brought in, canned, loaded back aboard the ship, and brought back to San Francisco. And during that time, the name of the ship was changed from Balfutha. It was changed over to Star of Alaska. And take a look at this long table. This is where the fishermen would eat at long tables such as this. And as they would sleep in bunks in this area. We don't have the bunks here anymore. And then there were foremen going to Alaska as well. They were the supervisors in the canneries. And they slept, there's a row of doors here, or companionways, as they call the word ship, and they would lead into the cabins for the foremen. We'll see later a part of the uh, Chinese cannery workers' folksal that's been restored. But for now, we're going to walk over into the captain's cabin talk about the life of a captain and his family. He could bring his whole family with him. We're walking in and here is the pantry. And the food for the captain, the officers and family is cooked in the galley where we saw, but it was brought into the pantry to prepare for the captain, the family, the officers, prepared by a man called a steward. Steward served the captain. Could serve him as shaving water in the morning, fill the bathtub, etc. The food was a little different. Uh, still, there was no way to keep fresh fruit or vegetables, but they could get fresh bread instead of those hardtack biscuits. Uh, they could, instead of getting the beef and pork from the wooden barrels, they could have canned food. Typical to have canned fish, canned meat, for example, some canned vegetables. So it was a little different diet for the captain and his family, the officers. The mates would be here too. The two ship's officers, besides the captain, were the first mate and second mate. Let's take a look into a mate's cabin. Here's a mate's cabin. Had his own desk, his own bed, place to hang clothes. And there were two cabins, one for the first mate, one for the second mate. That's actually a fair amount of room. It was. 
and privacy too, like the sailors who all 22 sailors were in one area called the forecastle. Pretty green on that wood. Yes, beautiful wood, beautifully varnished. We have a volunteer named Thomas who does all the varnishing aboard a ship. Is that what they call and, a bird's eye? Uh, right. Uh, he's uh, Thomas is uh, he's 83 years old and he's one of our regular volunteers. Wow. So we can thank for all the beautiful varnish. Yep, keep on it here. So here is the captain's saloon. There's a wood burning stove for a little heat. You can see how low the furniture is. And that's because as the ship is rolling, you don't want to be falling off a of high furniture. So it lowers your center of gravity. There's a gimbal table, meaning as the ship rocks, the little ball bearing under it will keep it from rocking as well, from food falling off. And if we look up, we could see the wine glasses hanging upside down the wine and liquor bottles. Now today in bars, you can see wine glasses in the same, in the same way, hanging down. And the bars that are ashore, that's something they learned from these sailing ships. That's why you see it. And that's to just keep them from falling off and breaking. So first the captain and his family would eat together and then the first mate and second mate would come in and eat together. And while the captain's eating, the first mate takes over his job. Now what happens if the captain is too ill to command and he hands it over to the first mate and then the first mate is too ill to command? Second mate is more of the enforcer. He doesn't really know navigation uh, as well as the first mate or the captain. But there's one other person who did learn navigation and who could be given command, and that was the captain's wife. And there were cases when captain's wives were given command of ships. One famous case, a clipper ship, captain's wife uh, was given command. She was uh, age 19 at the time and pregnant. The captain got tuberculosis. She was given command and got the ship safely through. Her name was Mary Patton. And, uh, and unfortunately, she died at age 23 when she caught tuberculosis. But she commanded the ship through storms and didn't lose a, a single man. So one example of captain's wives being given command of ships. Kind of barely see the high chair from here because of the lighting. But right where JR is pointing is the high chair. And there are actually two babies born aboard ship. One of them, her name was... Into Francis Durkee. So Captain Alfred Durkee and his wife Agnes, well, she gave birth on a voyage between San Francisco and India. So they named her Inda Francis Durkee. In, Inda for India, Francis for San Francisco. Mm. And in 1954, when this ship was restored and then later opened to the public, Inda Francis Durkee, now in her probably mid or late 50s, came back to rechristen the ship. Oh. That's cool. Right at her birthplace. Wow. Here we're going to see the captain's cabin, I'd where like the captain was slept. And you're going to see two photographs. One is of Alfred and Agnes Durkee, and the other one is of Inda Francis, taken when she was a little girl, probably about five years old. And then off to the left of the photos is a bed where you could pull it out, and that would be the bed for the captain and his wife. There's a little sink there for washing as well. What they needed it contained this little space. So the ship is really like a little city in a way. So everything is needed for the whole voyage. All the food, medicine, clothing. They had a store called the Slop Chest, and the captain's wife could manage the Slop Chest. So if sailors needed anything, bought on credit, new clothing, for example, tobacco, whatever they needed, they would keep in the Slop Chest.
here's the ship's wheel, the helm. Now, this is called the poop deck. Or not, well, you might think it's called the poop deck. <laughs> Comes from an old French word, poupé, even before that, a Latin word, poupus. And it could be a statue, literally a doll in French, but in this case, in medieval French ships, they had decorative statues back here called poupé. And this was the poupé deck. And then English shortened poupé to poop, and this is still today known as the poop deck. And there was a compass that used to be in that, that's called the binnacle. Compass is not there anymore. And the captain, all the orders started with the captain. So he would tell the mates the course, the mates would tell the sailors who were back here steering. And again, in movies, we see captains steering these ships, but in real life, there would be sailors steering it. So, when you're turning this wheel, I'm going to start turning this wheel around. And if you get a command for one full turn or two full turns, you keep turning until the pin here with this gold-colored metal brass here is at the very top. And that's how it designates you've done one full turn when this comes to the top or how many turns you've done. And this one is called the kingpin. Oh, so it's that's most important. That that's why we sometimes call a person a kingpin. Oh, that person's the kingpin of something or other. Very important person because this is such an important pin here to designate how many turns you've done. It's amazing. Now imagine doing this in a storm. Happened. Ship is pitching and rolling, and he might get swept overboard with waves coming aboard. So sometimes, sometimes sails would lash themselves here around and uh, keep themselves from being washed over. In a storm, you might have up to four sailors, two on each side at this wheel in the worst storms because of all the power uh, waves that are going against the rudder down below. Again, it could be pretty backbreaking work in a storm. And here, this is covered right now, but this is a skylight that would go right below into the captain's cabin. Now that's nice. And uh, here we have a seagull taking in our program today. <laughs> it's <shaking>. Hello, seagull. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> All right. So, seagull, do you have any questions? <laughs> no. Okay. Says, Where's the food? <laughs> Where's the food? That's right. I think they're probably thinking that all the time. What a beautiful <laughs> shot. Look at that scene. Yeah, isn't that? You got the Golden Gate Bridge out in the distance. We have across the bay the town of Sausalito. Then we have a little island called Belvedere. And then we have a much larger one, Angel Island, where there was an old immigration station. And then in front of Angel Island, we have Alcatraz, the rock, the famous prison that ran from 1934 to 1963 as a federal prison. And that prison is uh, open as a, another national park site. Maybe, uh, maybe, if you haven't already, maybe sometime it can arrange you in at Alcatraz for a virtual tour. Nice workplace you guys have. Well, that's a great shot. Yes, oh, it is. A clue that. We have a fellow doing virtual photo walks for us that did the swim from Alcatraz to the mainland a few times. Oh, yeah. Nice. We just had a couple recently. One is called the Shark Fest, and the other is called the Escape from Alcatraz. <laughs> <laughs> well, looking ahead, I mentioned a volunteer, Thomas, who does the varnishing, and he's here right now. Oh, wow. We're going to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thomas, we're doing a, a virtual walk, and this is a walk for people who are reviewing this who, yeah. who can't get out. Yeah. And I was mentioning earlier the varnishing work yeah. you've done. So well, this, is, this a, is my work over here. That's it's right. Beautiful <laughs> work. Hi. It's, it's beautiful work. work. 
the years before, I've been doing it now for the last eight years, every piece of wood around here at least has been varnished at least once, sometimes twice, okay? And presently, uh, we are finishing the rail all around here. So that, if you figure, that's about 300 feet this direction of both sides at 600 feet, and then you have another 40 feet here and another one there. So it's a lot of work putting together. I am presently working on the capstan over here, and I, I uh, started to varnish it, the first one from that one. So now, after every, every, every uh, varnish, you have to sand it down. It's very, really, very fine. And you can see this right here. <laughs> That's incredible. Oh, wow. I, I, uh, that, that's the original one here. Uh, uh, before, that's always only the, the first the first layer. And now I, I sanded it down. You can see. Yeah, it so, creaks. So the very fine thing has been taken off. So now comes the second step. And we do it six times. Every piece of wood which is varnished is being varnished six layers. Uh, and you might uh, why is that necessary? But if you do anything less, then the uh, life expectancy of it is reduced to a fraction. So we have to do it six times, which is six times varnishing, six times sending. So that's 12, 12 operations on every piece of wood around here. But Wow. You know, I think it's a pretty stupid word. It is. It's, uh, it is, um, well, it, 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 it's always the same thing. However, once it's done and you look at it, you saw it before and after, that's the satisfaction which you have. Oh, okay. don't pay me enough. <laughs> That's true. And see, you have a lot of satisfaction in your work because it gleams. You have to love this kind of work and the, uh, the, uh, the thing which is, you do it all about because once you're through, it looks nice and shiny. Yes. yes. A lot of patience. Very good. Well, thanks, Thomas. Thanks okay. much. You're welcome, Thank Peter. you very all much. Right. You're welcome. Uh, all right. He's well, we're going to head down below deck to an exhibit called Cargoless King, which really covers between decks below. It's all about the history of the cargo the ship carried from her different eras, from the era in the grain trade. One other uh, I didn't mention earlier was um, from 1899 to 1902, before she became star of Alaska, she worked in the lumber trade. She was bringing lumber flying under Hawaiian flag, bringing lumber to Australia to build mines there. That was three years of her career. So wow. we're going to take a look at all those careers heading down below. All right, we're in between decks, cargo is king exhibit. Let's start off with a quote from Irving Johnson, who was uh, an American who sailed at age, and when he was in his 20s, uh, in 1929, sailed aboard a German ship around the Horn, became a captain himself later on. And here's what he says about cargo. Why do you do it? Meaning, why do you sail? Why do you do it for cargo? Cargo is king. And if you don't bring in dry cargo, you might as well stay at home. For cargo is cared for absolutely. The seamen must take care of themselves. <laughs> so the life of a sailor was really second to the life of the cargo itself. That was the most important thing. So here are various cargoes she carried. Here's cement from Belgium, used for construction in San Francisco in these wooden barrels here. And I want you to imagine this entire area filled with cargo from top to bottom. We couldn't walk below here once it was filled. We want to get as much cargo as possible aboard the ship. Here are plates from China. And you'll see a broken plate, and that's just part of the exhibit on purpose of the show. Important was to pack everything tightly because if you don't 
pack your cargo tightly. If you have grain, it could shift and even capsize the ship. If you have barrels, they could open up, things break. So imagine this area packed to the gills, just from top to bottom, from side to side, every inch packed with cargo. Pianos from Germany, it's another cargo. And here from Europe, a display case for wealthy families who could display valuables and show them off to their guests in the parlor. Here's olive oil from Italy, Cadbury's cocoa from England, Coleman's mustard from England. In here, they would have tea from India. Also from India, jute to make canvas sacks. A lot of the grain was stored in this kind of sack. an amazing job on that display. It's really, really great. It is, award-winning too. It's won a couple of national awards. Longshoremen back then were hired, what was called the shape up. And it was a very arbitrary system, pretty corrupt system. At six o'clock in the morning, they'd go down to the docks and uh, the supervisor would pick out who he wanted to work that day. And there were payoffs to the supervisor and such, pretty corrupt system. That changed after the big strike of 1934 here on the West Coast and Longshoremen won their rights to a union hiring hall and that was the end of the shape up. It was interesting that shape up system was still going on here and that it was outlawed in the 1890s in London, for example. Once the sacks uh, were brought in, everything was put in compartments. And here's an example how these would keep the sacks, even packed tightly, you want to keep them all together with these wooden base compartments. So Chinese cannery workers, they would come from both Southern California and from Chinatown here in San Francisco. They were brought up to San Francisco by a steamship and they were lied to. They were told by the contractors who hired them that they'd be working out of San Francisco and being put up in a hotel. But instead they were strong arms onto the sailing ships such as this one, brought up to Alaska, working the whole season in the canneries there. Now, because they were hired by contractors rather than the canning company or the ship itself, uh, the ship could absolve itself of any responsibility for their treatment. Oh. Um, so it's all done through contractors who would go out into Chinatown and they would advertise for these jobs and they would sign these workers on. They lived in the forecastle, and this is only a small section of the forecastle. This has been preserved. But let's take a walk through. We'll see where the Chinese cannery workers live. We'll see their bunks. So that was just legal slavery. Yes. Yeah, it was um, a certain term for it that, is, that escapes me. Um, thank you. Yes, I was just reminded by Mark, debt peonage. Well, the people who worked, whether you're a sailor, a longshoreman loading, going up to Alaska working in canneries, you're, you're just desperate for work, you know? Yeah, any kind of work or starve to death. It, it, that's right, exactly. Outside, there's, uh, they brought their own cooking pots. There were sacks, we're gonna see over here uh, where rice was kept. So the rice was all 
wrapped up in these. They had a big pot for cooking rice. And also, uh, we're not really prepared for the cold uh, in Alaska. So you can imagine at that time, extreme cold weather. So this worked in the Alaska trade up until 1930, 1902 to 1930. 1930 was the last time this ship sailed commercially. The last time she sailed under her own power for any reason was in 1935. She went from uh, San Diego to Baja, California with a group of young people, cadets, going later in some merchant marine. She also was a movie ship in 1934. She was in the original Mutiny on the Bounty. Oh, wow. She didn't play the Bounty herself, but she played another ship uh, in a harbor scene. And they changed the way she looked to make her look more like a ship of the 18th century rather than late 19th century. So she was a moving ship. Uh, she was uh, later bought by a couple, last name of Kissinger. I don't think any relation to Henry Kissinger, same spelling. And uh, they exhibited her as a, quote, pirate ship, which she never was. Changed her name to Pacific Queen, and she was right across the bay in Sausalito. Kind of like a carnival act in a way. Luckily, in 1954, our... Museum's founder, Carl Corgan, and his wife, Jean, and a group of people, including the editor of San Francisco Chronicle, and a group of businessmen and labor got together, bought the ship for $25,000. She was a fixer-upper. <laughs> so there was a big restoration project across the bay in Alameda. And then in 1955, she was brought here to the city, and she was opened up as a museum ship, a few piers down, but Pier 41. And then in 1988, she came to Hyde Street Pier, part of our permanent collection here. I have memories as a little boy when I was about five years old, six, seven, eight, taking trips to visit the Balakutha when she was at Pier 41. Wow. So of those 700 ships built to carry California grain to Europe, this ship is the very last one in existence. So very fortunate that we have people in the world who see these ships as valuable um, to open up to the public and preserve. So Carl and Jean Cordon were very important in preserving the ships we have here and also other ships around the world too that uh, Cordon's were involved with helping save. So there are maritime museums around the world. And of these big square rig ships of all the different trades, they're about just under 50, maybe 40, 748, 49, still in existence, uh, held at maritime museums. Wow. Out of the many thousands of ships. Very lucky to have them here. It's incredible. So this gives us a look at the three different careers of the ship, of what life was like typically aboard a square rig ship. It shows us a lot about society at the time, too. It's sort of the... the uh, hierarchy of society. You could see that hierarchy aboard ship between the poor and the more wealthy of the captain and officers, um, about race relations aboard ship, about the building of our economy. We saw see the whole seas of our present day economy by looking at these ships. And then we look at these so universal values of, of courage, for example, fear, loneliness, all these come into play uh, in the world of sailing aboard ships. So they really connect us with today in so many different ways. So are there any other questions you might have? Feel free. Mostly want to thank you. This has just been wonderful. Yeah. Stop on this tour, but we'll walk up to the deck and take a look at some of the canned food also here brought up to Alaska, brought up and stored in the pantry. Yeah, I was wondering if did they ever fish to for food while they were at sea? Yeah, yeah. The question is, did they ever fish for food? And Look at that. ships going around Cape Horn, sailors would often throw a line overboard to try to catch a fish for themselves. Never enough 
as part of their daily diet. But if they were lucky to catch a fish, they could give it to the cook, cook it up for them. Cook would take a little for himself, give the rest to the sailor. But yeah, some of the uh, the interviews of the old sailors um, that were done by the Library of Congress, 1930s. They would say, some of the sailors said that there was never a day that would go by in, in calm seas that you wouldn't see several lines overboard from sailors trying to catch fish. <laughs> yeah. Would that be the, let's see, we have the giant tree brands, the Alta Vila brands. Do you have anything that says Thomas, uh, Thomas, um, Thomas brand? That would be my sister's uh, father-in-law. Is that, that one you saw here? Uh, I, that's what I saw there, yes. Oh, okay. Let's look for Thomas Brand. I'm not seeing Thomas. I did, I was, Wonder Cooking from Gilroy. Tomatoes. Wonder, oh, Wonder made. Cooking from Gilroy? Yeah, yeah I haven't that's seen awesome. that Wonder Cooking. Uh-uh. That's the first time I've ever seen that one. Cool. Golden Gate Packing Company from San Jose. Um, Alta Vila Brands from San Jose. They would batten the hatches, covered with wood, and covered, that was covered with canvas. So the important thing, a very good point, because the important thing is to keep all the cargo as dry as possible. It gets wet, it gets ruined. Could you scan back up that mass there for a moment? Sure. Uh, if you want to take a look at the, the mast? Yeah, yeah, just scan up it. Yeah. It's so big. Oh. Hmm. Wow. Imagine, imagine putting that all those things in place. Wow. Yep, running up and down. Climbing out the spars. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> I wonder how often people got trapped in those little spots. <laughs> yeah. Those sailors would have to often climb aloft out onto the yards. The yards go across the mass horizontally as the sails hang from, and they, if you can see, there are these long ropes, a rope that goes underneath each yard. The sails would stand on those ropes and lean over, and they have to pull up the sails by hand yeah. and <laughs> twirl them, meaning folding them in and tying them down. And imagine doing that while the ship is rocking and rolling and pitching in the waves. Uh -oh. <laughs> and often during a storm, they'd have to just keep a few sails down, but furl up most of them. And they always carried extra sails aboard ship. So once you're through a storm, Sales are getting ripped up. They just replace sales with new ones. That's there had to have been job. some. There had to have been some fatalities there just trying to do that. Yeah, yeah, they were. I have a question about weight. Uh, you may have mentioned earlier. It, how heavy is this ship, and then how heavy would a cargo be? The yeah, ship is twenty three, um, two thousand three hundred. Um, tons and she could carry I'm sorry 1300 tons and she'd carry twice her weight in, weight in cargo about 2600 tons of cargo wow yeah so typically ships could carry about twice the weight of the ship itself and how long is she 301 feet long okay. counting the bowsprit the right. very uh, bow of the ship Well, at the end of a voyage, instead of saying farewell and good luck, their way of saying it among sailors was fair winds and a following sea. <laughs> that means farewell and, and good luck. So that's what I want to wish you. Thank you. Uh, fair you winds so and a following Thank you. sea. Thank and you if you think of any more questions in the meantime, Carl, I'll leave my email address with uh, your fearless leader, Will Wright, and and uh, 
And you have my permission to pass them on to the people who are uh, in today here with us. And uh, feel free to email me if you have any further questions. Oh, oh thank, thank you. you so much. This yes. has been wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let me get a screenshot of this. Hang All on. Right, thank you. All right, wave, 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 wave. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Okay, if awesome. you excuse us now, we're going to take a voyage around the horn, yeah. and we'll see you in about six months, hopefully, if we survive it. All right. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, John. Yep.